So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, at least EU time. Um, as you can see from the slide here, we're going to have a round table discussing research, which asks the question, does the inclusion of non-trade provisions in European trade agreements have an impact on the realization of non-trade outcomes? So essentially the question is, do we see a relationship between inclusion of these non-trade provisions and actually improving the, uh, the results? Do we see that happen in terms of after agreements are signed, do we see those effects? The, the work is ongoing, and I would like to stress that uh, the presenters are going to talk about one piece of that puzzle. There is other work ongoing, which digs into different dimensions of this question. So we're very keen to get people's reactions and suggestions for further work in this area. Uh, the speakers are Miriam Manchin, um, who is joining us from Croatia, but teaches in Milan, and M Matteo Fiorini, who is now with the OECD Secretariat, but was very long affiliated with the research project that this is an output of uh, RESPECT, which is a Horizon 2020 uh, supported research program. We have two discussants. Um, one comes from the European Commission, uh, Alessandra <coughs> Tucci from DG Trade, who is, of course, representing a, an organization that actually negotiates at these agreements, but she's not a negotiator. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but she's in the research part of DG Trade and really focuses on economic analysis of, of everything trade related that the European uh, Commission does. Our second discussant is Michele Ruta, who is with the World Bank. And he's been leading a very large project, essentially mapping uh, trade agreements, uh, as in, in particular, the depth of, of preferential trade agreements. So he's a very good uh, discussant for this project, which really focuses on what do we find in trade agreements and do those things have an impact? Uh, can we look, can we see if there's an impact in terms of what happens in the real world? So I'm going to turn it over. Who's going to start, Miriam or Matteo? Uh, yes, I will start. Right. So I'll start with Miriam, and then you guys have 25 minutes or so, and then we'll go to the discussions. OK, so let me share um, my slides with you. Um, so this is um, a working paper now, but it's, as Bernard said, still work in progress. Um, and as you can see, we are many very many co-authors and some of us are here. Um, Matteo is uh, also here and Filippo is here and Bernard is here. Um, so I think if you will have very difficult questions, they will also be able to help me out here. So uh, just to um, uh, start a little bit with the motivation, why we do this. Uh, I think most of you know, and you're familiar with this, that um, e, the, the Article 27 um, stipulates that cooperation and promotion of EU social, civil, environmental, and juridic juridical values constitute one of the pillars of the treaty. And the treaty and the functioning of the EU stipulated that EU trade policy must be consistent with this principle. So hence the inclusion of these issues in chapters in PTAs, which has been increasing over time. And I will show you some um, descriptive statistics on this. Uh, more and more of these um, non-trade issues have been included in uh, PTAs. So it also reflects um, the, 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 the desire to, in a way, protect project and, and promote these EU values um, towards um, uh, EU partners. So basically the commercial policy can become an instrument to, to achieve these goals. And uh, so what we actually do in this paper, we try to see if including um, these non-trade provisions in EU PTAs have actually a systematic um, a significant positive effect on non-trade outcomes of partner countries. So ideally, 
this is what uh, you would want if you include these in the PTAs, but it is actually um, an empirical question whether we, we observe that or not. Um, in the paper, in this um, working paper we published, we just focused on three main issues. Um, and these are uh, actually included in more than 50% of EU trade agreements. And these are civil rights, labor rights and environmental protections. So um, I can go more into details uh, if you have questions on how we uh, capture this. I will talk a bit about the data, but these are basically captured as three variables capturing these three main um, dimensions here. So um, before jumping into uh, what we actually do, I want to outline um, briefly how we think about this, how, how we can measure it or what we expect uh, to measure here. So the first question I, 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 I talked about is basically a direct effect. So a direct effect of non-trade provisions, which are included in trade agreements, affecting the non-trade outcomes in the partner countries. And this is where we will be mostly focusing in, 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 the, in the results, but I will also talk a bit uh, about indirect effects, which could go through trade with the EU. So instead of the provisions um, directly impacting non-trade outcomes, it could be that trade indirectly affects non-trade non, um, non outcomes. And this could be in, in, in various ways. And there is actually empirical evidence that indeed um, trade can improve uh, many of these uh, outcomes in, in partner countries. What actually complicates things here um, for us is that there could be um, actually a reverse causality. First, just focusing on the, um, the red line we will, we will talk most about. Even there, you could say that if there are, um, uh, let's say, uh, worse non-trade outcomes in partner countries, maybe the EU or other countries um, designing the trade agreements would, would actually focus more on those uh, issues and include more provisions on that. This could be, you know, again, uh, thinking about uh, labor rights, um, you can think of many, many, many um, issues, uh, child labor or environmental protection, where you could think that in countries where um, there's a significant environmental degradation, uh, such as burning uh, rainforests, this would actually be more included in, uh, in the agreement um, uh, as provision. So this is one issue we, we will have to be very careful about, and we are quite confident that we actually managed to talk about the red um, uh, line in, in, in the direction we want to talk about. There's also, of course, a possible reverse causality in the, the indirect effect, um, because it could be that um, the EU is trading more uh, with certain countries with certain outcomes, let's say, maybe um, it's, a, it's you know, cheaper labor forces available in countries where you have less stringent labor rights, but it could also be that um, you know, trade with the EU improves uh, outcomes. So countries are uh, have an incentive to improve those outcomes because then um, inputs um, to the EU for the uh, production, for example, um, are easy, easier to sell. So it again can go either way. And we're not going to uh, actually uh, talk about indirect effect, uh, um, causality in the indirect effect part. And this is a bit more work in progress and it's, it's, it's quite challenging. Uh, just to very briefly say something about the related uh, literature, um, there's more on indirect channel, on the direct channel, uh, there isn't 
too much. And most importantly, there isn't anything um, 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 on, on causality. So most of the evidence or all the evidence we, we came across was on correlation. So this, indeed, it's challenging, um, but I think we are, at least this, this uh, we managed to solve, not yet um, the indirect uh, part. So the data we use is uh, just really briefly, um, there's a, um, a data set we compiled um, on uh, known trade outcomes and it has many more dimensions, uh, but it has a good number of observations on the three main issues we will focus on. And because we have um, many variables, we, uh, we undertake a principal component analysis, which allows us to have uh, basically just one measure for each um, issue. So we have this basically kind of a summary measure for each issue. Uh, then we use a non trade um, issue database uh, by Lisa uh, Lechner, which includes um, uh, over 665 PTAs over a long time uh, period, allowing us to have um, uh, a measure of uh, specific provisions being included in PTAs. And we also use uh, trade uh, data from, from uh, Comprade. Now, before I'm going into what we find, I just want to give you a little bit of stylized facts, um, what we see in the, in the data. This map shows you uh, a percentage change in um, our first um, dimension, civil rights, um, and high change from 95 until the end of our, our um, data set. And you can see that uh, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So the green color means an improvement. So there was um, uh, the, the greener it is, the more, um, uh, the higher uh, increase in these, um, in these values are. So the, uh, the better the civil rights are in those countries over uh, the, the last couple of um, decades. And the darker red it is, the worse it is. Um, so I think what, what is uh, striking here that there is a huge heterogeneity uh, going all over the place. Uh, among the countries. And the same uh, uh, what we see uh, with labor rights. So there are big differences between countries. In some countries, there's a, an improvement. In some countries, um, there's no improvement or actually things get worse over time. Uh, a little bit more homogeneous what we see in our third um, um, area, which is environmental protection. And here you see a bit, uh, of an improvement in most uh, most uh, most countries, not all. So you can see that some are red or orange. Uh, those are not showing any improvement, uh, but uh, quite the contrary. So that's uh, one thing we we see in the outcomes. Uh, what about trade and provisions in in PTAs? In the left panel here, you see the change of the the the, the, the number of uh, these provisions being included in PTAs over time. So starting in 1960, uh, you can see that uh, all three areas were, were uh, actually just uh, a little bit included, uh, not much, and that was mostly um, economic and social rights, which was in, uh, included. Civil rights and environmental protection, much less. And that changed over time. And you can see that by um, 2020, uh, most agreements included uh, these issues as provisions. On the right panel, you see the importance of EU as a trade partner. So, we are focusing here on the EU and EU PTAs. And also we, you will see that we also take into account how important EU as a trade partner um, for these countries, uh, trying to capture this indirect link I was talking about. So 
you can see that there uh, the EU as a trade partner um, for, um, for the countries in our sample, which are uh, mostly developing countries, have been uh, going down. So uh, uh, the first stage where we try to capture both this indirect and direct channel, uh, we really just talk about correlations. We are not able to establish here causality. What we will do here is look at how these three different non-trade issues are related to um, non these non-trade issues being included in EU PTAs to the trade intensity with the EU and to the openness of the country. So that measures general um, openness to how much the country is trading. And uh, the second trade intensity with the EU is the share of exports, imports, or trade with the EU in total exports, imports of trade. So the trade, the importance of the EU as a trade uh, partner. And this is just uh, writing this down for, uh, to, to be a bit more formal. So we will run this simple regression where on the left-hand side, we have these non-trade outcomes, civil rights, environmental protection and labor rights. And on the right-hand side, we have most importantly provisions openness, the intensity uh, of EU uh, uh, as, a, as a trade partner, and then we also include country and time fixed effects. So this is what we um, get as results. So in the panel A, in the first table, you see civil rights being on the la left-hand side, uh, panel B, environmental protection, and panel C, labor right protection. So the first most important thing we wanted to see is provisions being included in uh, PTAs. And you can see that uh, for civil rights, we have a significant positive correlation, but for environmental protection and labor rights, uh, we have uh, a negative significant correlation. So it's quite um, striking, um, but could be, you know, uh, signaling that uh, something more is going on than what we thought, first thought. So uh, it could be that when thinking about environmental protection, um, what is more important is what we, you know, what I was talking about, uh, potentially this, this reverse causality, which is, which is actually uh, showing up as this negative uh, correlation. So, um, when the other thing we did, which 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 is showing you how um, uh, the provisions are might be differently um, playing a different role in countries where uh, uh, the EU is a very important export destination or import or just generally trade partner. What we see that what matters mostly. In, in, for example, in civil rights, is um, the EU being an export destination. And you can see that for countries where the EU is a more important partner in case of civil rights, it seems that actually um, there is a positive correlation. So again, I'm not saying this is causality, but maybe uh, there is potentially an effect of uh, a bigger pressure that you can actually put on these countries. Uh, but we don't see that for environmental protection and we see actually the opposite for labor rights. So this, you know, this could be that um, provisions are including these more because already, because there's an issue. It could be that the EU is trading more with these countries because you could have maybe cheaper uh, labor in, in, in this situation, but this is, a uh, really just um, correlation. So um, at this stage, I think we are not able to uh, exactly answer uh, some of these questions, which uh, these results actually pose and which I, I find quite interesting. Um, if you look at uh, general openness, it, it is also um, quite um, striking that it's negative and in, in most cases significant. So the more open uh, the countries, it seems, the worse their outcome are in civil rights protection, environmental protection, um, labor rights. 
Again, um, I'm not saying openness causes these worse outcomes, but uh, there is a clear uh, correlation um, here. So um, I think I, I said that all and I'm, I, I don't want to take Mateo's time. So I stop here my um, slide and pass it on to, to Mateo. Um, I think you can share it or, yeah. Okay. Yes, thanks a lot, Miriam. Thanks everybody uh, for inviting me to uh, put on my EUI hat again and, uh, and present uh, this research that we conducted uh, um, within the framework of the RESPECT project. So let me follow up on, on what Miriam said and, uh, and uh, tell you a bit more um, of what we did uh, toward the assessment of, a, of the causal effect of non-trade provisions for uh, non-trade outcomes. As Miriam already discussed, there are indigeneity issues that prevent uh, us to claim that the correlations uh, that we just saw in the tables are actually um, reflecting a causal effect of non-trade provisions on non-trade outcomes. In general, uh, this is, a, this is a very difficult exercise. Uh, there are many potential uh, strategies that can be applied. Uh, uh, there, is not a, there is not a perfect solution, but the, the one that we're presenting here today and that we, that we uh, implemented during our research is uh, the application of a synthetic control method um, that I'm gonna discuss, uh, that I'm gonna discuss today. Um, let me... <sighs> Let me give you um, a bit of a background on the methodology. Actually, before doing this, let me let me jump to uh, the key conclusions of uh, uh, of our of our work, so that if we get bored uh, on the technical details, uh, at least you have the you have the um, the main results of our analysis. And actually, the the causal assessment that we that we are able to to get thanks to the application of the synthetic control methodology gives us, uh, uh, doesn't give us a, a, very, um, a very clear pictures. Indeed, there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, in terms of uh, individual treatment effects. So the non-trade provisions can have very, very different effects uh, depending on the trade partner and the issue area, as we will see in a minute. And um, there are a number of policy implications related to this uh, very unclear uh, pattern of, uh, of uh, causal effect that at the aggregate level doesn't seem to show any direction. So at the aggregate level, when we will aggregate these results, considering all the trade partners uh, that we tested in the analysis, we will see that we cannot claim any significant direction of the effect of including non-trade provisions across the three issue areas uh, um, where we that that we that we investigated during our research, um, but now that <laughs> that we know that the outcome is not is not uh, so clear cut, let me let me spend a, a couple of slides uh, in telling you how we uh, how we got there and how we reached this uh, this this outcome that has important policy implications. We believe so in any problem of uh, causal inference, uh, um, the, the exercise, instead of estimating something that, that is never observed. So um, if one country signs a trade agreement with the EU that features a non-trade provision, then we can observe what is the performance of that country in terms of the relevant non-trade outcome after having signed the agreement. We will never observe the performance of the same country uh, without the agreement being signed. So we will never observe the counterfactual. Uh, our job here is to come up with a, with a smart strategy to estimate that counterfactual and to compare that counterfactual, which is gonna be a synthetic counterfactual with the, actual, um, with the actual evolution of the outcome variable of interest in the country that signed the agreement. Um, the synthetic control uh, methodology um, proposes a, a very specific strategy to estimate the counterfactual. And actually, instead of estimating it, it builds a synthetic counterfactual, a synthetic control. So 
just the minimum terminology that is necessary to, to understand the, the logic of the exercise, so we will have to identify a treated unit, so a country that gets a treatment. And in our case, the treatment is gonna be defined in terms of signing an agreement with the EU and including the relevant non-trade provision. So you can already see here that one limitation of our approach is that the treatment has two components, signing an agreement with the EU and including the non-trade provision. So I can already tell you that it's gonna be, uh, it, in, in, this, in this presentation, you will not be able to distinguish actually the effect of the two, signing an, an agreement with the EU and featuring the provision. We, in, in alternative exercises that, that, will be, that will be definitely included in the, in the final respect report, we, we conduct these type of exercises, but here we, we look at the joint effect of signing an agreement with the EU that includes the, the non-trade provision. That's gonna be the treatment. A treated unit is gonna be a country signing such agreement. Uh, the treatment period or occurrence is going to be the year of signature. And for each treated unit, we have to come up with the, a donor pool of control units. Those uh, control units are uh, other countries that are signing in, uh, in, a, in a period close to capital T, the treatment occurrence, a trade agreement but not with the EU, nor including the um, non-trade provision of interest. So the control units are gonna take a pill that is pretty different from the pill that we're giving to the treated unit. The treated unit takes a pill that is a trade agreement with the EU featuring the non-trade provision. The control units take a pill that is just a tra trade agreement, not with the EU, not including the uh, relevant non-trade provision. So what, we're, what we are able to, to compare here is, uh, you know, what is the effect of taking, signing an agreement with the EU and that includes the provision. Um, we do a number of uh, technical uh, additions to these uh, basic principles that I just uh, told you, including the fact of making sure that all the control units didn't sign in the, in the, um, in the relevant period in agreement uh, with countries that tend to have the same approach, uh, a similar approach with respect to non-trade uh, objectives, uh, such as the US, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So we really want to make sure that the control units in the donor pool are taking a different pill, are signing a trade agreement, yes, but a pretty different trade agreement that doesn't have the components that we're interested in, that we're interested in, in estimating the causal effect on the, on the non-trade outcome. Um, now that we have our treated unit and our donor pool of control units, we need to combine those donor pool, those control units to build the synthetic control. How do we do this? We, uh, we write an algorithm uh, that basically generates a linear combination of the outcome variable taken a bit from each uh, control unit with weights that reflect the similarity of uh, each controlled unit in terms of key variables of interest. What are those key variables of interest? Are predictors of the outcome variable. Uh, and there are, they're listed here, the past performance of the, of the relevant non-trade uh, uh, outcome, um, GDP, economic size, GDP per capita, the level of economic development, population, and trade with the EU. The outcome of this exercise is coming up with a synthetic uh, time series of the outcome variable of interest that we can compare with the outcome variable with the evolution of the outcome variable in the treated unit. And uh, this is the result. The result of the synthetic control uh, methodology is a series of pictures. And uh, there is a big uh, open and fast evolving debate on, on the possibility to make statistical inference with these pictures. But these pictures are the natural output of the synthetic control. Um, so I, I really hope that the technical uh, ingredients are to some extent clear. Uh, and now we can look at the pictures and, and uh, find uh, uh, and validate what I, what I sort of previewed for you before. So uh, each raw here in the, um, the, the, the first raw uh, made of three panels uh, um, is uh, a series of results for countries on the uh, civil right uh, 
civil right outcome. The solid line is the evolution of the civil right uh, indicator that Miriam described before in the treated unit. So in the first case uh, is Egypt, in the second Mexico and South Africa in the third case. The dashed line is the evolution of the same outcome in the synthetic control. So in the left-hand side uh, chart, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but in the, in the top left uh, uh, panel, you can, re you can see that we have evidence of a negative effect of uh, signing a trade agreement with the EU that features a provision on civil rights. In fact, what you see is that the solid line after the treatment occurrence, which is this vertical uh, black line, drops with respect to the synthetic control. And you can also notice that before the treatment occurrence, there is a pretty decent matching of the two of the two series, which means we have done an, a relatively good job in, in building the synthetic control. So negative effect on the left-hand side, and you see the same here for Jordan on environment. There is a negative effect. So the solid line lies below, actually departs from the synthetic control line and, and, goes, and goes below uh, below that meaning that the effect of signing a trade agreement with the EU featuring a provision on, on, on environmental protection actually had a negative effect on, on, on this particular uh, country. In the central, in the central uh, charts, we see basically no effect. Uh, the matching that we managed to reach uh, uh, pre-treatment uh, continues after, uh, after the treatment. And in the right, uh, in the right part, uh, what we see actually, let me minimize this window, yes. So in the right part, what you see is a positive effect. So after the treatment in, the, in, those, uh, in those cases, South Africa for civil rights, Egypt for environmental protection, you see a positive effect of signing a trade agreement with the EU featuring the relevant provision. And in the next slide, you have the same thing. So the same all possible outcomes also for labor rights. Again, negative, no effect, positive effect. Um, we claim that this is a, a, a rigorous assessment of the causal effect of signing a trade agreement with the EU, including the non-trade provision for that particular country. Um, what you've seen here is, a, is an individual causal effect for a specific trade partner on a specific issue area. Now we can combine these, uh, these data and uh, um, that's, that's what we do in this table to come up with an aggregate result. On average, what is the effect of including, of signing a, a trade agreement with the EU, including a relevant non-trade provision on the non-trade outcome? Uh, it's a, basically we apply a difference in difference uh, uh, equation to the, um, to the data generated by the treated unit and the synthetic control and the, the regressor of interest is the interaction between a dummy for, for being treated and the, uh, um, and the identifier of the treatment period. And you see that there's nothing statistically significant. So on average, the combination, the aggregation of all these individual causal effects doesn't deliver any clear message in terms of, a, of, a, of an average causal effect of, of uh, uh, EU trade agreements featuring the provision. So, I can see that I'm five minutes over time. I apologize for that. Just uh, uh, one slide on uh, key policy implications coming out of this, uh, of this work. Again, we have seen uh, that according to our um, framework, there is actually an ambiguous effect of non-trade provision. They can uh, have a direct effect on the non-trade outcome, um, hopefully positive, triggering uh, domestic uh, uh, policy reforms in order to meet the requirement written down in the, um, in the agreement. But they can also have a, a negative effect uh, potentially on trade because it's more difficult to, um, to focus on the trade part when you have so much on the non-trade part. And having a negative effect on trade, this can actually um, this can actually sort of deactivate the indirect effect that Miriam was, was, was talking about. The empirical assessment uh, in terms of correlation is heterogeneous and diverse, as, we, as Miriam presented. The empirical assessment, when you are serious in, in, uh, in, uh, in tackling the causal effect, uh, is also very heterogeneous. And uh, at the aggregate level, there is no clear picture. Uh, monitoring is essential. So if, if, uh, uh, if we want to continue, um, uh, with, with a strategy that 
that actually um, sees trade agreement as a, as a vehicle to, um, to convey values that go beyond the promotion of trade, it's very important that we do a very serious uh, data collection effort and, and, and monitoring effort because uh, outcomes can be very, very diverse. And, and it's very important to, uh, to keep monitoring the situation and, and potentially adjust. But our analysis doesn't come doesn't deliver any any uh, best practice or uh, optimal optimal solution in this sense. So again, um, monitoring is is essential. The synthetic control methodology can be a useful tool uh, in the in the monitoring activity. There are limitations. So I I quickly flagged a couple of them. There is more in in the in the paper, and more will be detailed in the in the respect report. But you know, we, uh, for the first time, we, we apply the synthetic control methodology to this particular research question, and we believe that there is some potential for, for further application. And with that, I, I, I thank you very much for your attention, and I stop here. Great. Thanks a lot to both of you. So as I mentioned, we have two uh, discussants who can weigh in on whether they agree with, with the conclusions of this. And in particular, I think we're looking forward to also suggestions on what else could be done in terms of uh, pursuing this line of research. So, Alessandra, floor is yours. Um, can I share my screen? I have a presentation. Yeah. Mia, can you make Alessandra co-host? Yeah, it's done. OK, wait a sec. Uh, I hope. Yeah, we can see it. Good. Okay, let me. Thank you first. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to read the paper and uh, discuss it. It was very interesting, and uh, I hope the the comments I have, which will be very much linked to the day to day policy challenges we have when it comes to what we call the TSD issues, trade and sustainable development issues in the in our uh, digitrade jargon. So a uh, small summary of the paper, which is not necessary, was all very well explained. This idea of testing the direct impact of non on non-trade outcomes of the inclusion of trade and sustainable development chapters or provisions in FTAs. And uh, this inconclusive uh, uh, results, which, you know, given the average of positive and negative impacts overall, it seems not to be, there seems not to be impact of these provisions. So what are we uh, talking about when we have when we talk about these provisions, at least uh, in, in, uh, in the EU trade agreement. First of all, I think that the civil right provision is what we call the human right provisions, which are mainly about the promotion of the democracy, the rule of law, and the respect of human rights. And these provisions are uh, what we call the essential elements, which are included not necessarily in the FTAs, but the, in the political framework agreements, which is something broader than the FTA. Um, FTAs are generally linked to this political agreement. And FTAs would include the human rights provisions on their own, only if there is no uh, overall political framework agreement. And these provisions are, you know, given that we call it essential elements, they're very important, you know, linked to the, the, the Treaty of the EU. And a serious breach of one of these provisions can become a, a nuclear bomb and trigger the suspension of, in whole or partly, of the overall framework, the political framework, including the FTA. So it's, um, it's exactly it's one type type of provision, and then there are the labor and environmental provisions, which are equally important. But those are 
only in the FTA, usually. And what are in practice these provisions are commitments to effectively implement ILO core labor standards, including the ratification of ILO conventions and the promotion of the ILO decent work agenda. So that's the standard um, provisions that are, in, that are included to uh, promote and to improve the standards in the in the partner country. Same with the environmental provisions, which is basically the effective implementation of the multilateral environmental agreements. So, for example, nowadays we ask the effective implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. In the past, it was the, the other relevant agreements. So we're not imposing EU environmental legislations to th through these agreements. That's quite of a, uh, a big difference. However, it has also to be kept in mind that these are not the only elements in, the pro in these chapters. Another very important element is that is what we call the non-regression. The, the parties agree not to relax their labor and environmental standards in order not to attract trade of investment. So there is a, again, an element of improving the standards and a an element of what we call the level playing field. So the, the nor it's kind of two separate elements that are included in, um, in the TSD chapter. And of course, there is a monitoring mechanism based on transparency, a lot of dialogue, cooperation, and eventually a dispute settlement procedures in case these uh, dialogues and cooperation do not bear the fruits that we think should. And maybe then, I don't know, you've heard about the case of the Korea agreement where after 10 years of dialogues, we took, we used, uh, we triggered the dispute settlement mechanism that was within the agreement. And, um, this kind of framework, this kind of uh, TSD chapters were firstly um, or developed in this way for the EU-Korea agreement. So we're talking about 2010. Provisions were also in previous agreement, but were scattered around and were not so um, systematically organized as since as, as it is since uh, the Korea, and for which we, we developed a template for the chapter, so which is a, a standard set of um, of uh, provisions that we then uh, negotiate with our trade partners with a clear and unified approach. At, at least that's what what we try. And then this this template has been progressively improved you know, since 2010, and it, the, 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 the scope of the provision has increased, but also the strength of the provision, including the enforceability. So, you know, there is a, there's been a progressive um, development of this kind of, uh, this kind of, um, this, kind, this chapter in, in our FTAs. And uh, let's, We'll go back to the end, and I think that's something that should be kept in mind. This, the time variation, the, the, the variability that there is in this because of many reasons. So what are my main comments? First of all, it's a very useful work that you're doing. Um, when it comes to trade policy these days, it's top of the agenda. It's top of the agenda for the European Parliament. It's top of the agenda for the uh, the Council, the EU member states, uh, recall the discussion we have in, uh, on Mercosur and its environmental uh, provisions. And of course, it's top of the agenda within DigiTrade that we have to come up with solutions for all the, the, the issues that are raised out there. Um, when you, uh, in, in your analysis, of course, 
uh, you identify this big issue that is endogeneity, which it's reverse causality, as you say, but I'm also thinking about omitted variables here because there are some shifts out there that are both affecting the inclusion of the provisions and to some extent, even the outcomes. And, you know, and I'm thinking all the level playing field issues that are developing um, at the global level, for example. And unfortunately, what I'm afraid, I don't think that the synthetic controls is really the silver bullet here. It's a good idea to try, and I would have tried as well. I'm not sure, you might convince me otherwise, but I'm not sure it works. The first problem I find of this specific analysis is with synthetic controls is the selection of the agreements that that you include it. So, you know, because of all kinds of constraints you had with the methodology, you had to stop at agreements um, negotiated or implemented until 2008. And that is the, the main issue I find here is that nothing of what we call the new generation agreement is being include, included. Nothing that has a, um, a worth uh, calling a TSD chapter. In, the, in those agreements before 2008, there was not really a proper TSD chapter. We're really talking since from Korea onwards and all the subsequent agreements, EU, Colombia, Peru, and all that came afterwards. And um, so even like, you know, later you, you show uh, EU Chile, EU Mexico, you know, those are agreements that we are renegotiating these days. So we are modernizing these agreements. They're really the old generation ones. Um, and then uh, again, you take this agreement. What is not very clear, it's which trade partners make up the counterfactual. So you don't show, you know, the, the list of uh, partners that for each one, make up the synthetic control and there is still you said you try to you you try to control for it which is important but do you really manage to separate the impact of the signing the fta uh because you know how many ftas are out there uh if you exclude the eu the us australia new zealand canada all the developed countries how many ftas are out there that can help uh, matching this, um, uh, can help creating this, uh, this synthetic counterfactual. Um, and, you know, to separate the impact of the FTA from the, the impact of the provision is really important because otherwise your matching variables like GDP would be naturally affected by the treatment if the treatment includes the FTA. So the, the whole construction gets weaker. And then again, here there is an issue to me about the level of, of aggregation, uh, even in the in the variable itself, not just you know the across countries when you aggregate an average, because really not all the provisions are the same. Some are really from some we would expect an improvement. The non-regression provision, we are happy if country stays as they are. They you know, they don't go backwards. So uh, I think in order to, if you start mixing all of it together, you just, um, you know, you're more likely not to find an, uh, an outcome. So you should start thinking of something a bit more disaggregated. And also, you know, about the, the underlying outcome indicators that was not described in the paper. Maybe that I, I need to read the, fault, the accompanying paper, papers, but um, also that, you know, one thing is, is the, the actual outcome. One thing is that, for example, something we look at is the reference to the legislation. You know, ask, have country really ratified ILO conventions or not? Is you know, something very tangible that isn't, 
it's generally also reflected in, uh, uh, in indicators of labor rights, but not necessarily. And and to the end, you know what we can say that the 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 final aim of the of the chapter is to have countries ratifying, let's say, ILO convention ratifying the Paris Agreement. Uh, then whatever the consequences are. So these are my main comments. Um, I hope I was not too transient. And I think that what I mostly liked about the paper is your quest for the causal effect, which is please do not give up because that's what we need in all, uh, in all sense. Um, my suggestions actually would be also to try the the old fashioned IV, because I see that in um, IV strategy, you can go, you can have more disaggregated variables you can use. And uh, if you differentiate between the different issues, more, for example, you know, separating the labor rights from the environmental uh, standards, you can start thinking about. Uh, provision specific instrumental variable and having, for example, inspirations from, from the political economy literature, um, because there is a lot of politics behind this, a lot of it. It's not, you know, these are, these are not provisions that are included in trade agreement because of economic uh, reasons. There is something else that, that is asked. And, you know, that's what one idea I was getting while reading the paper. For example, the balance of power in the European Parliament is not, is the outcome of people voting, but when Europeans vote, they do not have in mind the labor condition in third countries. But then the balance of powers in the European Parliament influences how much because different parties have different opinions on how much labor rights in third countries should be promoted. And the, the latest uh, European, uh, the latest balance of power in the European Parliament is very different from the previous one. So it's, it's just a suggestion. Uh, you might have much better ideas than this, but that's what I would start reasoning in uh, when I would start thinking about. Um, IVs. And exactly, this idea of bundling everything together, both in terms of provisions and in terms of outcomes, I'm not sure it will lead anywhere. You, you, I, I'm afraid if you start just bundle everything together, you will not find uh, uh, a significant result. And again, I think it's, um, as I mentioned before, I think the time variation that you have in strength and scope in these provisions over time, it's something that is worth exploiting in, a, in an econometric analysis because I assure you there is this time variation. There is this uh, increase in strength and increase in scope in, the, in these chapters. And then the other thing that you should keep in mind as well is that when we, include these provisions in the, in the FTAs, there is always a very long-term approach. Um, you know, I was looking at your synthetic control diff and diff graph. We don't expect something happening in year one from this. Um, you know, something start like you would expect a reaction to a tariff reduction, a reaction to a an MRA on uh, professional qualification, you would expect a year one, year two impact. Here, there is really a long-term strategy. You know, uh, as, a, as a reference, it took us 10 years to initiate a dispute with Korea on this. There, was, there were 10 years of dialogues before, um, before the dispute. And, and again, exactly, you know, we don't expect that countries in year one start to implement all the, 
all the, let's say, the conventions that they haven't ratified so far. We give them time. And I'm, that was my, my last. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for, for all of that detailed uh, comments. I mean, some of these things are clearly things we've been thinking about, but I think you've also identified a number of potentially new avenues that we can uh, pursue. Let's turn to Michele, who I think is going to tell us a bit about an alternative approach that he's been using uh, to actually get at the answer to the question we're posing here. Michele? Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, actually, if uh, Mia can allow me to share the screen. Yeah, it's already perfect. done. Thanks so much. Sorry, just one second. I guess you guys can see my, my slides, no? Yes. Uh, don't expect anything to review with the slides. It's more for me to remember what I, what I want to say. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And I, I thought Miriam and Mattel uh, did a fantastic job in presenting um, the, the work. Uh, so I would like to, uh, well, obviously, let me say first that uh, it's an important topic because we don't know that much about it. Uh, we know uh, in part, thanks to various databases, uh, including the one we have been doing at the World Bank, that uh, uh, governments keep including um, these uh, non-trade policy areas in trade agreements, uh, being environmental uh, protection, uh, uh, labor rights, uh, human rights, or even others are not included in the scope of this uh, research, uh, such as corruption. Um, and uh, we don't know that much about the effects. So there is a quite a broad literature out there uh, that uh, uh, talks about issue linkage. So why these uh, uh, non-trade issues are included in trade agreements and when it makes sense and when it doesn't. It's mostly a theoretical literature, but there isn't really that much that looks at the, of the effects. Uh, uh, there is something that looks at the effects on trade, but not really on the effects on, uh, on non-trade outcomes, which is, um, but at the end of the day, we would be interested in because we want to know if these, these things, uh, these provisions will work uh, or not. Now, part of the reason why um, this is not uh, an area where there is a lot of empirical work is that uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, uh, area. Uh, and I think this paper does quite a bit in moving the uh, pushing forward uh, um, uh, what we can do. Uh, I'll, I'll take my head of discussions and take my, my job description seriously and so I'll try to be a little bit critical. Um, but I think it's very useful to do what, uh, what uh, uh, Bernard, Martin, Miriam and others have been trying to do. Uh, now, why is this difficult? Uh, I can think of three conceptual issues that make this a difficult question. And obviously the presentation touched on, on all of this. The, the first is uh, the endogeneity of these provisions uh, in, uh, um, uh, in trade agreements. So in other words, the content of trade agreements is, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, random. Um, so the traditional uh, um, uh, identification strategies that we have in the literature on, uh, on preferential trade agreements, they are meant to deal with the fact that uh, country pairs that sign an agreements are not random. That they can be uh, natural trade partners, and so that's why we use the country prefix effects, etc. But here it's a different type of endogeneity uh, because it's at the provision level, as uh, it has been explained. Uh, the second uh, conceptual problem uh, is that obviously we want to differentiate the direct impact of these provisions, uh, say, how uh, provisions that protect forests uh, uh, have on the forestation outcomes from the indirect effect that come from the fact that uh, um, the trade agreements uh, are likely, and hopefully we, we, we hope that's the case, they boost trade and because trade changes, there can be other effects on uh, um, uh, non-trade outcomes. And this effect, by the way, and I'll come back to this, can be very different uh, between different um, uh, 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 non-trade policy outcomes. The third uh, um, conceptual problem that I have in mind, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, 
uh, I called it a, a per country effect. So th this is really two different things. The fact is that obviously the, the EU is a, is a big uh, entity, it's a big country. Uh, so whenever it, it does something, uh, there are effects on the members, but also on the non-members. Um, so we, we can worry that, for instance, if we sign some um, uh, environmental provisions uh, uh, with a partner, then there will be effects on, uh, uh, on non-partner, meaning, for instance, uh, some industry may relocate. And this is important because it has to do with the um, untreated units uh, in the identification strategy. And I'll say something more in a, in a sec. The other problem is that obviously the EU is big, but it's not alone. And there are other um, countries out there that may sign agreements with uh, a similar uh, objectives. So a country that signs an agreement with the EU and has some provisions it may have similar provisions in other agreements. Um, and so these are the, the three conceptual issues that I, that I have in mind. Now, th this paper uh, um, talks uh, uh, about uh, uh, all of them, uh, but there are some, some limitations. So the diagnosis is somehow um, correct. And then the cure has some, some aspects that are positive, some others that are uh, less so. So the one that is it's key here, and so I'll spend more time on this because it's the, it's the central point, is this, this issue of endogeneity. And so what the paper does uh, is obviously it's very aware, well aware of the fact that the, there is an issue there and proposes the synthetic control uh, methods uh, to, uh, to address this, uh, this problem. So what this uh, SCM does, it, it matches the treated countries to counterfactual countries uh, based on some uh, pretreatment uh, uh, outcomes. So we, we basically want to see, uh, to find some countries um, that before the, the treatment, before the, the shock, uh, in terms of those outcomes, uh, behave similarly and use these as counterfactuals. Now, the problem that I see here is that uh, what we would really want uh, is to have the fact that the provision is included in uh, uh, an agreement to be explained. So rather, um, we will, in other words, what we will really want to find is a group of country of uh, un untreated uh, units that have characteristics that are similar to the treated units um, and that basically would have, uh, we would expect them to have those provisions uh, included in the agreement, but for some reason they are not. So in, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that while the, the SEM goes some ways into um, uh, addressing the endogeneity problem, I'm not fully convinced that uh, it, it goes uh, uh, all the way. It does to the extent that uh, these characteristics that uh, justify that, that uh, um, justify the similarity in the uh, pretreatment uh, uh, outcomes are are the ones that also explain why we would expect uh, those provisions to be there. So the, the the reason why I'm saying this is that in a in a uh, related paper in a, another paper that we did that to try to identify the effects of the um, environmental provisions on environmental outcomes. Um, we spent quite a bit of time thinking about uh, an alternative approach uh, um, to address this endogeneity issue. And, and so what we tried to do was to use um, propensity score matching, which has exactly the goal of trying to identify the, the, the match, the group of, uh, of uh, uh, countries or the group of agreements that would have uh, um, the same characteristics uh, as the treated units. Uh, um, and then we use those as counterfactuals. So uh, I'm just saying all of these in part because I have some skin in the game because we spent time uh, uh, developing this alternative method, but also to, to stress that uh, uh, when we look at the outcomes, uh, uh, so the results of the SCM, um, it's possible that these results are in part driven by the fact that um, the, the counterfactual is not uh, um, ideal to address the, 
the uh, the problem than the genetic problem that we uh, have in mind. Obviously, you know, stepping back and looking at different methods, all methods have some uh, upside and downside. So probably we would like to look at different methods and and uh, uh, in order to draw policy conclusions. Um, now I'll be quicker on the other things because I don't want to take too much time for the discussion. Um, the direct versus indirect effect of uh, uh, non-trade uh, policy provisions. Here, what I, I thought that is that there was a good discussion in, uh, I believe, section two, when the, the, there was the conceptual uh, um, uh, part of the paper. Then when it came to uh, the execution, and uh, uh, Matteo mentioned this, uh, uh, this was a little bit lost. And, and it was lost essentially because uh, we could not really differentiate between uh, uh, agreements and agreements with uh, uh, provisions. And I'll, I'll have a suggestion on how to address this problem in a, in a moment. Um, again, the, the third country effects uh, um, is something that uh, uh, is uh, part of it is mentioned. And uh, uh, I think Matteo was saying that uh, in trying to find um, um, the untreated uh, uh, units, uh, uh, basically, they were excluding from the analysis uh, um, agreement signed with uh, the US uh, or other large play players and they have similar provisions. Um, so that's, that's in part uh, um, taken care of. Uh, the, the other aspect of the problem is that obviously whatever the EU does can have impact on on third countries, that, that part I didn't uh, uh, see uh, being discussed. So my concern in other words is when you try to find a synthetic uh, Mexico, that's, that's what the SCM does, it creates a synthetic uh, Mexico for environment. So that, uh, that synthetic has uh, one or more likely a group of uh, donor countries, uh, a group of countries, and those may be affected by um, the the EU agreement uh, uh, with, uh, with Mexico. So that's, that's the concern. Okay, now a couple more uh, issues that are specific to the paper. Uh, they relate to what uh, Alessandro was saying as well. So in part, you, you will have a little bit of deja vu. Um, so one issue uh, that I was thinking is the enforceability issue. So if I go back to one of the first papers that, that they try to look at, uh, in, uh, with data, um, the, uh, what, what is the content of trade agreements uh, and why it matters, uh, is the work that um, Horn, Mavroides, and Sapir did uh, in 2010. They then insist quite a bit on the fact that the um, EU agreements have a lot of legal inflation, by which we mean, they mean that uh, uh, enforceability uh, is not strong, especially on many um, non trade policy. Uh, provisions, so it's, uh, they, they may not really be legally binding. Uh, when we did the, the, the database at the World Bank, which stand uh, in part uh, that, that work by Horma Bard and Sapir, um, it's not only the EU, there are many cases where there is uh, a lot of legal inflation. But I think it's important to, to try to separate between enforceable and unenforceable provisions, and the data are out there, so something could be said. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuring that data that you that you use, but you know, other databases have that distinction. So uh, something can be done in that regard. Another issue that I, I'm referring as the aggregation issue, maybe a better word would be a composition issue. And again, that's something that uh, I heard from Alessandra as well. So when you talk about non-trade policy um, uh, objectives, uh, of course, you, you don't want to uh, lump them all together, you immediately divide them into three buckets. And so you say environment, human rights, um, and uh, labor uh, rights. Now, within those uh, uh, buckets, there is a lot of heterogeneity, uh, obviously. And the, the provisions uh, may have, uh, say, if you have uh, provisions on deforestation, uh, on the protection of forestry, they may have an impact on uh, deforestation, but no effect on, uh, on, uh, on climate change. Uh, or when you aggregate all these things with a single indicator, um, you may miss uh, uh, an effect because of this uh, uh, aggregation problem. So 
having an analysis that is a bit more disaggregated may provide uh, um, um, better identification of results. Um, the definitive model, uh, I'll be very quick here, uh, but it goes back to the point that I was making earlier, trying to disentangle the effects of the um, trade agreements from the effect of the pollution. Um, here, uh, one approach that you could take is just use triple difference uh, when you do the, the regression analysis, uh, meaning you want to control for the presence of the ETA. And the reason why you want to do that is that uh, you want to separate <coughs> the effect that uh, non-trade provisions in trade agreements relative to um, um, agreements that don't have uh, the, um, the, the provisions. The way the regressions are right now, um, they mix them together because you are not controlling for the, um, the, the TTA. I'm assuming that you did this because you wanted to match the, the SCM approach, but um, um, I've also heard you're doing some, some other um, analysis. So this is something that you could consider the triple difference approach. Um, then I have a number of uh, smaller comments that have to do with the uh, SCM application itself. They're mostly um, technical and maybe a little bit boring. And plus, to be honest, I'm, I'm really not an SCM um, expert, uh, uh, so I'm not even sure if, if they're right. But for instance, one thing to consider is uh, um, to do a little bit more robustness uh, um, and be a bit more explicit uh, with uh, this uh, pool of donors. Um, so that the, obviously the synthetic, behind the synthetic, there is uh, a group of countries that were similar in the pre-treatment period. And it would be good to know um, what these countries are, what weights they are given, because I think as, as soon as you are uh, more transparent with uh, this aspect, you, you would notice if there are uh, um, problems uh, with, uh, you know, some, some intuitively make le less sense than, uh, than others. And, and obviously this also leads to, to some more robustness uh, in terms of the, the donor pool. Uh, um, uh, also, what I suspect is that you may have very noisy uh, results as you play a little bit around. Um, so let me stop here. Uh, last thing, uh, so thank you, obviously. Uh, go visit the, the World Bank webpage uh, on deep trade agreements. And if you're interested in working in this area, um, please feel free to drop in. Thanks. OK, thanks a lot uh, for all of those detailed uh, suggestions. Very useful for us. Before I go back to Miriam, Matteo, and, and others who are involved in this project, um, let me open the floor. So everybody who wants to intervene, just raise your hand, use the reactions button, and then there's raise hands. There, I guess most people will know the drill by now. Um, so let me know if you want to ask questions, respond to anything you've heard. In the meantime, maybe Matteo or Miriam, if you want to kind of take up some of the points that were made, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the super useful comments. I think as Bernard said, some of these are uh, work in progress or some of the things where things we didn't really talk about what we tried. Uh, but some of the things we should absolutely look into. I think last point of Michaela was that, uh, you know, that uh, there could be an issue with the donor pool. And indeed, this is a, this is a bit of a trade-off. So we do have data on, um, on how these provisions are enforced. We do have data on more new generation uh, provisions and PTAs. Um, and we, we can actually match the provision to very specific things. We can all do that with the trade-off of the donor pool. And this is, I think, what we try to balance 
Uh, so, you know, so first thing, we try to keep it as big as possible so that we have sufficient sample. And it was actually Filippo and Matteo going back and forth with the, with the sample and what we could do. So maybe I leave um, Matteo or Filippo if you want to, to get back on this. But I think, so some of these things we should absolutely try. I think we were a bit afraid on some of the issues that the donor pool is becoming becoming uh, too small. Um, just uh, reading the comments you made, I think the other point was maybe try propensity score matching. You know, I leave that to Filippo and Matteo to answer, but uh, I thought uh, that we actually went with a synthetic control method because it was somewhere in between uh, a matching and, and um, defensive. But indeed, I mean, we should probably, at least as a robustness, try a bit more on that. Um, um, I'm just, I took a note. So, oh, the third country spillover effects. I think it's super interesting. Um, and I think you're totally right. So this is something we, we should think about. I don't know if this would become a, a third paper or we could, we could still think about it because I, I think this is really interesting um, and we have to think about how to how to measure that um, um, I'm looking at quickly just Alice, Alice comments on so I think the IV um, it's it's a nice idea for the European Parliament um, but so for red power and I think this is maybe something we could explore as we go ahead and we try to disentangle indirect and directionals. Um, this is something we just started to work on and um, I'm not sure if it's it's going to work out but <laughs> maybe this is something actually we could try with uh, with the IV approach instead of the synthetic uh, control. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. We have to provide much more details on the control groups, the weights, uh, and a lot more um, what's going on in the synthetic control. So this was actually initially for um, a chapter in a book, which we turned into a working paper. Uh, but uh, we are working on um, a, a peer-reviewed publication version. And so we are preparing much more details on, on the methodology, on the data, um, on the outcomes we use, how we construct that and all that. So uh, you are totally right. We need much more on that. So maybe I, I, I pass this on to Matteo or Filippo uh, or Bernard. Yeah, thanks. If, uh, thanks, Miriam. And uh, thanks, Alessandra and Michele, for, for the great comments. Um, I, I just want to um, flag uh, that um, a lot in terms of the transparency that you are very rightly calling for is, um, is in a big report <laughs> that, that Filippo knows very well. Basically, we, we conducted dozens of different exercises, uh, writing super long routines. And, and for each exercise, we have a detailed uh, battery of uh, tables so with the list of uh, uh, countries in the, in the donor pool. Um, and you are, you're totally right. So in, when, you know, in, in packaging the, the final outputs, we will definitely need to increase the, the, the degree of, of transparency with respect to these important dimensions. Um, you you pointed to uh, the key the key limitations and issues with the synthetic control method. Uh, I agree this is not the silver bullet. Uh, we got a bit carried over at the beginning, carried away. Sorry, we we, we thought you know it, it's it's going to be great, it's going to be wonderful, and then you know month after month we realized that, that there were many issues uh, on our path. Still, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it, it was worth uh, trying it, and uh, and we and we definitely le learned something. And um, one important lesson is uh, is is linked precisely to the um, how to define the treatment. And uh, once you define the treatment, uh, uh, making sure that you have enough unit for your donor pool and enough meaningful unit uh, to build your synthetic control. And um, um, a lot. Uh, of what you suggested, like to focus on some dimensions of the provisions, like 
the, 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 the scope and strength of the provision, whenever you want to test for those specific dimension, then the treatment must be defined only in terms of that dimension. So the donor pool will have to be full of countries that have exactly the same, that eat exactly the same pill that is only different with respect to that small detail that you want to test the effect. Uh, and in particular, so if you want to test the effect of the strength of a provision in any EU trade agreement, then you need uh, uh, a bunch of uh, control units that signed uh, a trade agreement with the EU, including the provision, but with a different degree of uh, uh, enforcement. And that's uh, automatically, you know, reduces the, um, the, the, the list of uh, potential uh, donor pools. But, in, in the big report, uh, we have a list of these exercises. So we, we try to identify what is the effect of the provision, um, filling the donor pool with countries that signed a, a trade agreement with the EU, but without the provision. So you can really disentangle the effect of, of the provision. Um, these are super useful, uh, these are interesting trials, but I, I was kind of, uh, so to me it was important also to, 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 to listen what Alessandra said in terms of the long-term effect. So it's gonna be difficult to, to apply this, this methodology uh, to an agreement signed after 2013, if uh, you know, in the mind of the, of, the, of the negotiator, the effect has to be observed after 10 years. So we, you know, we, we just don't have data for that. It's, um, so definitely the synthetic control need to be uh, put aside uh, and, and, and a different strategy has to be, has to be found. Um, but yeah, so to those old agreements, we, we can do something. And I think it was worth, uh, it was worth conducting this, uh, this research. Um, and then thanks, for, thanks a lot for your very specific comments. Uh, these are well noted and we will definitely, um, we will definitely incorporate them once we, once we finalize uh, um, the different outputs that, that we have in the pipeline. Uh, I don't know if uh, Bernard or Filippo want to also follow up on, on your comments. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. So I don't see any other comments, questions. I think just in terms of the, you know, some of the other, some of the comments that were made. So I think one thing we really haven't thought about, and I think it's very useful that Alessandra mentioned that, is to make this distinction between what you might call proactive provisions, you know, where you have to do something or abide by some international agreements, a multilateral environmental agreement, what have you, but there's an action associated with that. So presumably things have to change over time in the countries that signs the agreement, as opposed to this uh, non-regression, you know, provision like you mentioned. <laughs> and again, so like I said, that's not something we've thought about uh, in terms of how you might actually do that. And clearly that's, that's something we need to, to think about more in terms of, you know, so, you know, there's, there's a whole literature on the effect of ratchets in, in trade agreements, uh, which, which this relates to. So we need to think about how we might actually do this. I think a lot of the questions that come up, and we've been around this bush a lot, uh, and, you know, one of the reasons we've used the synthetic control methodology is because, you know, it hasn't been used a lot in, in trade uh, and on trade agreements. So we thought we would try and see how far it, it takes us. But like Mateo says, one of the real downsides of this is uh, you need a lengthy period of time in terms of observations. So you can't, and this is really a big problem for this particular topic, because like you said, a lot of the action is recent, right? So a lot has been changing in the last decade and you, you simply can't use the methodology to get a handle on, okay, so what has that actually done? So <laughs> that does point to using other methodologies, right? So that, that's certainly something right, that we're also cognizant about. Okay, Filippo wants to come in because he couldn't find his raise hand button. I hope that is not the case for other people. Cause... But anyway, Filippo, why don't you, uh, why don't you come in? Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you, Bernard. And thank you very much to both Alessandra and Michele for your comments. And well, I 
just had some comments on your comments actually, and uh, some question about them. Um, my first uh, question that it, let's say somehow uh, crosses both your uh, advices and it's about uh, if um, in the intentions of the uh, of course of the EU we have long term impacts of these uh, agreements and as as uh, Alessandra pointed out. Uh, it might take even 10 years for effects to unfold. It might be that this new generation agreement are not, will not be uh, evaluated. There, there is no way they can be evaluated in their full uh, impact before, let's say, 10 years from now. So um, and one of the points of this uh, exercise we had, it was, OK, might not be perfect. We try to see whether some regularity can emerge. And I mean, another interesting thing is that there is no regularity. It's very much country specific, partner specific. Uh, and I mean, that was, I think, the bottom line of why showing these different graphs, showing different outcomes of all this, what happened. Uh, another thing was about the level of aggregation of the provision that both of you cor correctly pointed out and it was something we thought a lot about that, uh, and we are well aware of the limitations of trying to uh, fit everything, but as Miriam uh, stated, uh, it's very hard to uh, construct long enough time series so that we can actually compare countries which uh, have and have not signed some uh, specific trade agreement containing the provision we were looking for and that ha actually have the outcome we wanted to measure uh, for a long enough um, period of time. Uh, I, the, and finally, uh, about the, um, the cross impacts of the uh, of the trade agreements, uh, it was the third, the, the second point Michele raised uh, about uh, uh, that. Essentially, how I read it, uh, it was about uh, you might have an agreement who addresses one specific MTPO, but as an unanticipated effect, actually uh, impacts another uh, outcome. Is that what you meant, or? It, 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 not exactly. Uh, the, what I meant is that uh, the uh, provision uh, may affect a member, uh, but may also affect a non-member. Um, so if you have uh, uh, a provision on uh, labor rights uh, and there is an industry in the member country that um, uh, somehow relies on on uh, say uh, cheap labor, child labor, so to say, and then and then because of this provision, uh, it's possible that um, the, um, the industry moves um, to the next country, uh, say a neighboring country. And so why this is a, a concern is that uh, you use uh, as um, um, untreated units uh, countries that may be affected by the provision because of this uh, mechanism. Oh, okay, I, I probably, so I misinterpreted the, um, uh, the, the, the second comment because uh, I thought this was this, the, the, that's the so-called third party effect. So you have countries who are, might be, who might have some effect spilling over to them. But uh, I was interested because uh, I think it's also so, very so Filippo, relevant. Yeah. We've got to end this. It us. But I think if what I can suggest, what I would propose is maybe um, continue to have the discussion with Michele. Michele, I don't know if you have some time. Yeah. Right. So we can do a bilateral Zoom um, on that. Oh, yeah. OK. Yes, maybe I can send you an email, Michele, and we can also arrange to for, let's say, another day, if you prefer. OK, great. Very good. Okay, so let me let me thank again Michele and Alessandro for the really valuable feedback. It's been very useful 
to us, uh, as you will have understood, this is all very difficult uh, to actually get at the causality question, which is of course driving all of this type of research. And uh, I think we've got some good pointers on how to improve what we have, and again, as I said at the beginning, and as Miriam also mentioned, there are bits and pieces of this work ongoing. This paper is just one element of that. So again, the, uh, the, the suggestions and the inputs were extremely valuable to us. So I would say watch this space and watch the RESPECT uh, homepage in terms of additional publications and outputs. And I look forward to seeing you all again hopefully in the flesh in the fall sometime, whether it's in Brussels or Florence or wherever. So again, thank you and uh, a bientôt. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.